Good morning and welcome to Creating a Wildlife Paradise in Your Own Backyard, brought to you by the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. We're going to talk about Florida Friendly Landscaping Principle number five today, Attracting Wildlife creating a wildlife paradise in your own backyard. My name is Sarah Weber and I am the Florida Friendly Landscaping Education and Training Specialist here in Charlotte County, Florida. There's my email right there if you would like to uh, email me with any questions. For those of you not familiar with what University of Florida IFAS Extension is. Uh, Extension is a partnership between state, federal, and county governments to provide unbiased scientific research-based knowledge and expertise to the public. The University of Florida, together with Florida A&M University, administers the Florida Cooperative Extension Service. Here in Charlotte County, we have, of course, the friendly, Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. We have Sea Grant, we have 4-H, which uh, is all the youth programming. We have a family nutrition program, and we have the Florida Master Gardener program. So there's nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. We're not gonna go over all of these today, but they um, all collaboratively work together uh, for an environmentally friendly yard. Uh, the nine principles are right plants, right place, meaning if you plant the right plant with its soil, light, and water requirements, and you plant that in the right place, it has a much better survival rate and it should work well in your garden. Number two, water efficiently. Number three, fertilize appropriately. Four, mulch. Five, attract wildlife, which of course is what we're talking about today. Number six, manage yard pests. Seven, recycle. Number eight, reduce stormwater runoff. And last nine, protect, protect the waterfront. So our agenda today over this next hour presentation, um, our little overview, we're talk, gonna talk about providing shelter, providing water, managing that habitat, providing food sources, <clears throat> fruit bearing plants and some host and nectar plants for the pollinators. Let's start with talking about the importance of creating habitats. As you all know, urban or developed areas are rapidly increasing worldwide, especially here in Florida with so many people living and moving down here. Decisions can be made by the homeowners that can impact, really impact the environment. You think it might just be your one little yard, but if everybody works together, we can really make a change and creating more habitat where habitat has been lost due to development. And over 70% of the population lives in urban areas. Neighborhoods can have a positive or negative impact on both local and nearby wildlife habitats. What people do within their own yards does affect the nearby wildlife populations. Wildlife are affected by new ho or how homeowners manage their yards and their neighborhoods. There's also a concern um, there's with our Florida natural resources as far as jobs and economic impacts. All watchable wildlife activities generated $3.5 billion in 2006, and that's more than 51,000 jobs. Fishing, recreational saltwater fishing is worth over 5 billion and creates over 50,000 jobs. Freshwater fishing is over 2 billion and creates over 24,000 jobs. Here in Florida, we have the third most diverse wildlife population in the United States. We have 35 species of salamanders, 39 species of frogs, 48 species of lizards, 44 species of snakes, 26 species of turtles, three species of crocodilians, and thousands of species of birds. 
basics of creating habitats. We want to limit the amount of lawn. We're not saying no lawn, but the limit, more limited lawn, the better. Just plain grass, plain lawn is almost the equivalent to just having concrete for uh, wildlife. So we want to limit them out that lawn and plant a variety of flowering and fruiting plants. Use layering, uh, create vertical layering, use plants of varying height to create layers for shelter. And diverse areas attract a wild, wider variety of animals. So the more diverse areas in your yard you have, the more animals you're likely to see and assist. So we know animal habitats, they need food, they need water, they need shelter and cover, and they need space. Animals are only going to reside or forage in areas with appropriate habitats. They need cover. Talk about planting vertical layers, seasonal cover, brush piles, and snags. These are all helpful. Snags and brush piles. When trees die, please consider leaving them in the landscape as snags. Um, you may think that a dead tree in your yard might be unsightly, but as long as it's not going to fall and cause damage to your home or something else in your lawn, um, if you can leave them, that's wonderful. They're used for feeding and nesting. So this photo over here to the right, this is actually at my home. This is a sable palm that um, recently died. But if you look, we have two holes here that woodpeckers have been using. They're also feeding off the insects in the dead tree. We went ahead and put a cavity or nesting box here. And this part of the tree is not doing so well either, but the squirrels are nesting up in the top part of the tree. So this type of um, snag, it, these are really helpful to uh, animals if you can leave them in your yard. We do like to use bird, bat houses, and pollinators. Uh, these resources are primarily used by birds and bats, but if you take a look at this, this is a little, uh, a very small um, birdhouse that I had at, for decorative use in my yard. But if you see a little frog in there, the frogs and lizards actually uh, like to live in there. It's a little too small for a bird, but oop, a little too far, too small for most birds, but um, the lizards and frogs do like it. Pollinators. Pollinators are your bees, your butterflies, um, other insects, hummingbirds. So we want to have a lot of pollinator plants in our yards. You'd like it ideally include three or more flowering plant species that bloom each season. So something's always in bloom. Plant nectar and host plants for butterflies. Nectar plants are the ones that the, the adult butterflies feed off of and host plants are those that butterflies lay their eggs on and the caterpillars eat. You can provide places for bees to nest, to nest and avoid pesticides when possible. We're gonna get into that a little bit later on, but most bugs aren't bad bugs. Um, and we have a lot of beneficial bugs in our area. And like I said, we'll talk about that here in the next few slides. Providing water. A small amount of water can aid many animals. The sound of running water attracts animals. <clears throat> and water is of course essential for many functions for wildlife, drinking, reproduction, a bathing source. This photo down here on my left, this is actually our koi pond at our home. Um, the squirrels drink out of it, the uh, birds bathe in it, and uh, we do get a lot of wildlife because of having it there. Now you definitely don't necessarily have to have something so big, bird baths. Uh, are very helpful as well. And ponds for butterflies. Butterflies do have special requirements for absorbing food and water. Butterflies are incapable of drinking freestanding water. So you could provide a puddling station. Puddling stations are simple to make. You take a saucer, 
put a layer of sand in that saucer, add a layer of compost, put some uh, pebbles on top, and slowly add water to the top pebble layer. Bird baths. We want to keep the water clean and consistently available. We do not want to be breeding mosquitoes. That is the type of wildlife we don't want. So you do need to clean out your bird baths on a regular basis so the mosquitoes don't breathe, breed. Birds do prefer baths with textured bottoms for firm footing. Bird baths can be purchased at any of your big box stores, um, some home goods stores, or this one here, I have made my own. This is a glass dish, a glass footed dish with a candle holder and a large bowl on top. I use silicone to put those together. They're very simple to make and you may even have things at your home um, already that you can make your own bird bath with. Managing the habitat. We wanna manage pets, remove invasive exotic species, keep all the nat native vegetation if possible, use native vegetation when possible, and have some tolerance for the unwanted animals. There's a lot of animals, especially if you're new to Florida or you're not used to living down here, we do have a diverse uh, group of wildlife and there's some animals that some may see as pests that really may not be so bad once you learn more about them and what they do for our environment and ecosystem. This photo here is a photo of a mockingbird, which is Florida's state bird. Managing pets. Outdoor and feral cats are responsible for killing hundreds of millions of birds in the USA yearly. If you can keep your cats indoors, that is ideal. Um, also, if you know there's animals in your backyard and you have a dog, maybe stay with the, if your dog goes after animals, keep your dog on a leash or uh, supervise the dog while it's out there, especially if you know um, there's maybe slow moving animals like a gopher tortoise, which you see on the right, if there's something like that that's in your yard. And please don't release exotic pets into the wild. This is when we get invasive animals and it becomes a problem. There are places, if you have an exotic animal you can no longer care for, call your local animal control, you can call Florida Fish and Wildlife or call a rescue. Please don't release anything exotic out into the wild. And remove those invasive exotic species. Approximately 1.7 million acres of Florida's natural areas are invaded by exo exotic plant species. Invasive pest plants destroy natural habitat. Invasive exotic species in your yard can impact areas far beyond. So this photo down here is um, a photo of air potato that has just taken over all the native vegetation. So if you have any invasive plants in your yard, certainly that's one of the first things I would do is remove those invasive plants uh, because they do spread quickly. And even though you may just have a little bit in your yard, it will quickly destroy or quickly um, move on to your neighbor's yard and their neighbor's yard and uh, so forth. Once again, native vegetation. Native vegetation feeds and shelters our native wildlife. It doesn't necessarily have to be entirely native to be wildlife or Florida friendly but make sure you're not planting anything that's invasive or destructive to the environment. Native plants <clears throat> provide reliable sources of food and nectar. Managing weeds. A weed is simply just a plant that is in an unwanted area. So consider allowing certain weeds to grow, those that are native here, uh, to contribute to natural habitat as weeds do have their benefits. Here's some of our native wildflowers. On the left there, you see Coreopsis. This is our state wildflower. Blanket flowers in the middle, Gallardia, and horse mint. These are all easy to obtain. A lot of our local nurseries sell these plants. They generally seed easy, and they're drought tolerant, and they're great for wildlife. 
Managing pests. Reduce pesticide use when possible. Utilize IPM or integrated pest management, which we're gonna talk about in a couple more slides. You keep seeing that right plant, right place. If you plant the right plants in the right place, you're, you'll use less fertilizer, you'll use less pesticides. They are adapted to our area. Almost all wildlife, keep this in mind, almost all wildlife species eat insects in some way. So most insects, not all, but most insects are beneficial to, to our environment and to uh, keeping other wildlife fed. So integrated pest management, observe plants and lawns for signs of problems. Check your plants regularly for pests. Always start with the least toxic methods and spot treat. Avoid routine applications of pesticides. We don't want to go into our lawns and just treat the whole lawn for, pest, for pests. If you have a, a specific plant that is getting a specific pest, spot treat that plant. And before you treat, know the beneficial insects in your yard. Always have that pest I, pet or insect, insect ID uh, before you treat it because you never know it may be a a beneficial insect to have in your yard. For instance, ladybugs. Ladybugs eat aphids. Aphids are generally considered a pest, but ladybugs eat them. So if you see one of your plants with aphids on it and there's ladybugs around, a lot of time the ladybugs will just go ahead and take care of that problem for you, biological control. Go easy on the water and fertilizer. Excessive growth makes plants more vulnerable. Hand prune affected parts of the plants and insects and use oils and soaps before using stronger chemicals. This is from a blog that Carol Wyatt Evans from Sarasota County had wrote and um, it's, it's really great. When it comes to the insects in your landscape, 99% of insects are considered good, beneficial or neutral bugs. Here's some amazing qualities of insects. They devour bad bugs. One ladybug can eat as many as 5,000 aphids during its lifetime. A green lacewing larva can devour 200 or more pests per week. Insects pollinate. 75% of flowers and vegetable crops rely on pollination by insects. They some insects provide us with resources such as honey, silk, and wax and they compose the, decompose the dead stuff. Many insects are decomposers and help break down dead organic material, <clears throat> including dead plant material, <coughs> excuse me, animal carcasses, discarded food, and mulch. This helps in recycling the valuable nutrients back to the soil. And of course, once again, they're a food source. Insects are a food source for birds, mammals, amphibians, and reptiles. Tolerance for potentially unwanted wildlife. So I do understand that many people are scared of snakes or they don't like possums or, or other animals that may come into your yard. We may like the birds and, um, and the squirrels, but then there's some wildlife in your yard that may, you may feel that is unwanted. Sometimes it helps uh, to be educated and understand why animals are present. For example, Snakes, that's a black racer there in that top photo. Snakes are beneficial. Um, they eat rodents, they eat mice, my, you know, all sorts of rodents, mice, uh, rats, that sort of thing. And usually you see more snakes in the summertime because it, it's rainy season and they're trying to get up off of, uh, uh, up to dry ground. The more you know about an animal and the more educated you are, a lot of times um, they're not quite as scary as you think they might be. And they're not a nuisance like you thought they may, that, that they might have been. So if you can practice tolerance and educate yourself on laws protecting wildlife, because there are a lot of wildlife that in our state that are protected. The gopher tortoise down there at the bottom they are protected species. It is against the law to, uh, to harass them, to move them, 
Um, if you have an issue with one, maybe digging under your home or something of that nature, call Florida Fish and Wildlife, FWC, and they can help you with that issue. We have our diggers and our herbivores. Our diggers are things like moles, gophers, squirrels, armadillos, and tortoises. These critters actually have their benefits. They bring nutrients to the surface, they loosen it and aerate our soil, and they feed on turf and landscape pests. Herbivore, herbivores such as rabbits, ducks, and deer, they of course contribute to the food web and circle of life. There are things you can do to deter them if they are eating your garden and you don't want them to. Um, nuts, nuts and fences can protect fruits um, and there you can um, scare them off by maybe uh, ringing a bell or banging pans together and have them you know run off if those are not the type that you want in your yard. And if they're non-native then you can certainly call Florida Fish and Wildlife or Animal Control uh, or a private wildlife trapper if you have non-native animals in your yard that uh, need to be need to be moved on. Out of 44 species of snakes in Florida, only six of them are venomous. Most Florida snakes are harmless and beneficial and remove extra rodent populations. Even the venomous species are not particularly dangerous unless stepped on or otherwise provoked. Most people that get bit by a snake are either trying to kill them or provoking them. Um, so if you see a snake, just move away from it. If it is venomous and it happens to be in your yard or if it's in your house, if it's in your house, certainly call animal control and they will, um, they can come remove it for you. The little snake on the left there, that is a juvenile black racer, which they do not look, look like the adults. Um, many people get them confused with pygmy rattlesnakes because they do have similar coloring, but that is just a li little juvenile black racer snake which are good to have around the house. We do have a little video here from FWC regarding living with snakes and coexisting with them. It's just about a minute and a half long. We'll go ahead and play that. Welcome to Living with Wildlife. Did you know more than 40 species of native snakes live in Florida? Of those, only six are venomous. Some species are state or federally threatened, like the non-venomous eastern indigo snake. All of Florida's native snakes are beneficial, including venomous species. They serve an important role in maintaining a healthy ecosystem by controlling populations of insects and rodents. Snakes can live in nearly all of Florida's ecosystems, and some species are commonly encountered in urban areas. Most snakes typically try to avoid humans and will usually flee or hide when approached. But if you do see a snake, it's best to leave it alone and give it space. For more information about Florida snakes and how to identify them, visit myfwc.com slash snakes. Living with Wildlife is a service of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, managing fish and wildlife resources for their long-term well-being and the benefit of people. More at myfwc.com. Welcome to Living with Wildlife. Did you know more than 40 species of native snakes live in Florida? Of those, only six. Oh, 
Okay, expanding the scale of the habitat. Neighborhood enhancements. Large habitat is required for many species. So consider cooperating with neighbors or your community. You can enhance stormwater areas uh, with native plants that help give uh, more cover for wildlife expand green areas and create wildlife sanctuaries. Providing food for wildlife. If you can provide food all year, that's great. When we say provide food wildlife, number one is talking about planting plants with seeds and fruit and flowers for food. We, you can use bird feeders and salt blocks, cob corn, that sort of thing as supplement, but it's always great to be able to plant the natural things that the animals in our area will eat. And of course, native plants are always preferred. Uh, before you start planting anything new, uh, this is the USDA plant hardiness zone map for Florida. If you're in Charlotte County, like we are here, uh, most of Charlotte County is either 10A or 9B. Zone 10A is the coastal area and 9B is more inland. Oak trees are one of the top things that you can have for wildlife in your backyard. Now, if you are lucky enough to already have a large yard with oak trees in it, that is wonderful. Keep in mind, oak trees are, do grow huge. They can be very large. So some of our lawns here in Florida may not, this may not be an option for you because they are too big uh, for some lawns. But if you have acreage, if you have large property and you can put an oak tree in, if you don't already, uh, that, that's very beneficial to our wildlife. They provide shelter for many animals. They produce acorns, of course, which are an important food source for many species. White-tailed deer, gray squirrels, fox squirrels, flying squirrels, rabbits, raccoons, possums, foxes, wild turkeys, quail, wood ducks, mallards, woodpeckers, crows, and blue jays. Those are all animals that eat acorns. Beautyberry is one of my very favorite native plants. Um, this grows well in USDA zone eight to 10. It is a large shrub, about six to eight feet tall when it's uh, full grown, when it's established. It does well in partial sun to shade. It has purple or white blooms through spring or fall. Uh, the blooms are great for butterflies. They attract butterflies. And then when they turn into the berries, they provide food for wildlife in the fall and late winter. We have several different types of hollies. Uh, holly grows well in, depending on the type of holly, six, uh, zone six to nine. There's native varieties that like full sun to partial shade. Range varies. They are salt, drought, and shade tolerant. The fruit remains throughout the winter and attracts birds. Swamp dogwood does well zones eight to 10. It is a small tree, about 10 to 16 feet tall. Also does well in partial sun to shade, has flowers in the spring. The blueberries uh, provide food to birds and it is a larval plant for spring azure butterfly. Chickasaw plum, USA Zone eight to nine, it's a small tree, 12 to 20 feet tall, does well in full to partial sun, white flowers in the winter, reddish plums provide food for wildlife and can sucker to form a thicket. Hawthorn, zones eight to nine, it's a shrub, 20 to 35 feet tall, so this is gonna be a large shrub does best in full sun, and the flowers vary based on species. There's several different cultivars. This provides food and cover for wildlife because it is a shrub, it is thick, and the, uh, it's also a food source for birds. 
Southern red cedar, zones 8A to 10B, medium tree 30 to 45 feet tall, does best in full sun. It provides food cover and nesting for birds and attracts butterflies. Dwarf palmetto, zone 8 to 10. It's a small palm, 4 to 9 feet tall, does well partial to full sun, has white flowers and blackberries. The blackberries provide food for wildlife in the fall and the flowers attract the butterflies. Sea grape, zone 9 to 11. This is a smaller tree, also considered a shrub, 3 to 35 feet tall grown as a shrub on coastal dunes and as a tree more inland. Fragrant white flowers bloom in the spring and it provides food for large wildlife and attracts butterflies and birds. Florida privet, zone 8B to 11. This is a native shrub, four to 15 feet tall, full to partial sun, yellow spring flowers, and provides food for wildlife and attracts birds. Marlberry, zone nine to 11. That's a large shrub, 10 to 20 feet tall. Fragrant white flowers that bloom all year. It has attractive foliage. The purple fruits provide food and wildlife for wildlife and birds in the fall and the winter. Wild coffee. This is a super easy one to grow. USA zone 10B to 11, native shrub four to 10 feet tall. You've probably seen it around if you've been in Florida for a while. Partial to full shade tolerant, white spring through summer flowers, and it attracts birds and butterflies. The red fruit that it provides, um, it is food for wildlife. Honeysuckle, zone eight to nine, native vine 10 to 15 feet tall, and it does have a 10 to 15 foot spread. Red spring through summer flowers, the fruit provides food for wildlife. This is a great one to attract butterflies, hummingbirds, and other birds. Here's a ruby-throated hummingbird on a native trumpet honeysuckle. This is one of the hummingbirds we do get here in our area of Florida. Passion flower is also another one of my favorites. Grows best in 8B to 11. It is a twining vine, 5 to 10 foot tall and 5 to 10 foot spread. It likes full sun, although the uh, native variety down there at the bottom, the corky stem, will do okay in shade as well. It is larval food for golf fritillary butterflies and zebra longwing butterflies. So these butterflies go in, they lay the, their eggs on the leaves and the caterpillars eat, uh, eat the leaves. And then, see, let's see, top left there is that tiny little, right? There's a tiny little golf fritillary butterfly egg and this is what the caterpillars look like. And then this is what the chrysalis looks like. And then the male and the female golf fritillary. These are a very common butterfly in our area. If you have passion vine in your yard, I am quite certain you have seen these guys. This is our state butterfly, the zebra long wing. Their host plants also the passion flower. This is the caterpillar and of course the butterfly. And this is one of the passion flowers we have um, here in Florida. There are a lot of different varieties of passion flowers. We do have some native um, at some of the bigger box stores. They're, they do sometimes sell the natives, but uh, there are some other colors and so forth that are not native. So if you're looking to do native to attract the butterflies, um, make sure you're getting the right Passiflora species. Red Bay, zone 8B211. 
It's a native tree, 30 to 50 feet tall, does best in full sun, attracts butterflies, and is the larval host plant for swallowtail butterflies. And the purple fruit attracts birds. Milkweeds, we have several native milkweeds here in Florida. Most of them do best in zone eight to 10. It can be a shrub two to uh, five feet tall. It really depends on the variety that you're getting um, as far as height and spread. Um, most of them like full to partial sun. Most are self-seeding. Their nectar attracts hummingbirds and butterflies. And it is the larval host plant of the monarch and queen butterfly. Um, here's some, let's see, let me go back one. The one on the right there is butterfly weed, which is one of our native ones, Asclepias tuberosa. Uh, we've got swamp milkweed there on the left, Asclepias incarnata, and then aquatic milkweed there on the right that does aquatic, it does best in swampy, uh, more wet conditions. And if you look here to the right on all these little tiny dots on these milkweed leaves are monarch butterfly eggs. So they will hatch, they will go through five instars where um, they grow. And of course, all they do pretty much is eat, neat, neat until they're about this size. And then they turn into a chrysalis. And then of course, to the butterfly. And this is a monarch butterfly. This one is a male. You can tell it's a male because it has these two little spots right here and the females do not have those. Button bush, zone eight to 11. It's a small tree, six to 20 feet tall, full to partial sun. It is a flammable plant in wildfire prone areas. Uh, white flowers in the spring. They are quite funky looking flowers. These um, Nectar attracts the bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. Twin flower, zone eight to 11. This is a great native ground cover. It only gets to about a foot tall. It flowers all year with those pretty lavender flowers and it's a uh, larval food plant for the common buckeye butterfly. Golden dewdrop, which many know as Duranta. <clears throat> it is a shrub four to 18 feet tall, does best in zone nine B to 11, full to partial sun. They have showy lavender blue and white flowers summer through the fall. Their nectar attracts butterflies and hummingbirds and their fruit attracts other birds as well. Porter weed, this is another one of my favorites, um, does well in zone eight to 11. There are native and non-native varieties. Please get the native. Uh, the native is a little bit, doesn't get quite as tall, doesn't get quite as leggy. It stays a little bit lower to the ground, does best in full to partial sun, and the nectar attracts butterflies. This is one of the plants in my yard that attracts the most butterflies and bees and uh, pollinators. But please get the native as they're um, a lot of the ones that, that you can easily get around town are invasive. So get, make sure you're looking at the, the scientific name up here. Firebush. Zone nine to 11, large shrub five to 20 feet tall. It has orange and red flowers all year long. Foliage better in shade, flowers better in sun. Dies back in a freeze. We don't have to worry about that too much down here in South Florida. And it is a larval host for the Pluto Sphinx moth. Coonty, it's a great native shrub. Um, does well in 8B to 11, one to five foot tall, partial sun. It's Florida's only native cycad. And it is, is the sole larval host plant to the Atala hair streak butterfly, which you see on the bottom right there. Unfortunately, we don't have those Atalas here in Charlotte County. They're generally found only in Southeast Florida right now. 
Dutchman's pipe, USA zone nine to 10. It's a vine that's 10 to 15 feet tall, does best in partial sun, blooms summer to winter. It has medium drought tolerance and it is the larval host plant of the polydomus swallowtail butterfly, which I'll show you those in the next slide. Please use native only on this as well. There are quite a few different pipe vines out there. Um, and sometimes the common names are switched around. We want to use, uh, use native or Florida friendly ones only as some of the others can be invasive. This is the polydomus swallowtail that hosts on that plant. Once again, they lay their eggs on it. And this is what their little caterpillars look like. The first one to the left um, probably looks like first to second instar, not, not too far out um, from hatching from the egg. These guys do stay in groups, which is kind of fun until they get bigger and then they'll separate. Necklace pod, zone 10 to 11. Native shrub six to 10 feet tall. It likes full sun and it blooms all year long. Ne the nectar attracts hummingbirds and butterflies and the fruit provides food for other birds, but it is poisonous to humans. Shortleaf fig. This is a type of ficus. It does best in zone 10B to 11. Native tree, 25 to 50 feet tall, does best in full sun. It does have edible fruit for humans. You do not want to plant this in any type of drain field due to the aggressive roots. The fruit attracts birds and it is a larval host plant for many species of butterflies and the nectar attracts the butterflies as well. So these are just a, that was just a quick sampling of different plants you can use um, in your yard for attracting wildlife. And um, we do have our Florida Friendly Landscaping resources online. That book you see in the middle that says the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide to Plant Selection and Landscape Design. That is a wonderful book and it is available through our office it's also available online. You can download it. And the whole back of the book has all the different native and, Flor and or Florida friendly plants uh, for your yard that are recommended through the University of Florida. The Florida Yards and Neighborhoods Handbook on the left. It's a great handbook, how to be environmentally friendly. And your yard gives you landscaping ideas and so forth. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me, sarah.weber at ufl.edu. And if you're interested in more, please like us on our Facebook page. We have the UF IFAS Charlotte County Florida Friendly Landscaping Program page. And we also have our County University of Florida Extension Charlotte County page. We have a website there, UF IFAS Charlotte County website and the Florida Friendly Landscaping homepage from the state office. So please, free to, please feel free to utilize those resources and don't ever hesitate. If you have questions or concerns, give me a call or email me right there. Thank you for watching and have a great day.